Hello. Yes, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Chinna Prakash. Um, I'm really delighted to speak here in the Bangalore Tech Summit. And uh, I'm going to be speaking about the use of gene editing in agriculture, with special emphasis on how gene editing, crop gene editing can be used to enhance food security and also the nutrition, considering the theme of this particular session. I do thank the organizers for inviting me to speak at this meeting. And I'm really sorry that I could not be in person over there because of the pandemic. And then also that I had to do a recorded presentation instead of a live presentation because of the time, time difference. And I would like to, to share my screen and uh, use uh, my slides here. And so as you can see, the, the title of that, my talk is Crop Gene Editing. So I just wanted to remind the audience first that before we talk about how tools such as gene editing, including the CRISPR-Cas system can help improve our food system, we need to first acknowledge that human beings have been evolving their food to a variety of means ever since we invented agriculture, ever since we walked from out of the caves and began farming, we have been modifying our food. Most of the time, very slowly due to the slow selection, like what you see in maize here or in banana, when you look at the, the old, the wild relatives of the crop plants, the modern crop plants do not resemble their wild ancestors in many, many ways. And these changes we've been making through in the past 100 years through more scientific process of hybridization by crossbreeding, and also by mutagenesis, polyploidy, and uh, transgenic crops like the GMOs. But I want to focus on the latest iteration of these changes that we are making. And this is the genome editing, which we do with a variety of techniques, but most prominent of them is called the CRISPR-Cas method. And uh, the GMOs, the GM crops have been very successful in India. We have only one crop, BT cotton. And then this was introduced in 2002. And this entails the introduction of a foreign gene. And it, it requires substantial investments in terms of testing, mainly to comply with the regulation. But nevertheless, the GM crop has been very successful in India. It has more than doubled India's uh, cotton production, and it has substantially reduced the use of pesticides uh, in the Indian farms. And the gene edited crops will provide some of the same functionalities with greater precision of GMOs, but it does not necessarily involve introduction of any foreign genes. It's changing essentially the, the language, the DNA language within the crop and most of it is alteration of a very few nucleotides. And so hopefully because of that reason, it is not any different from the mutagenesis and uh, radiation induced or chemical mutagenesis that we do in crop breeding and should not be subject to the burdensome regulation and uh, like that we see with the GM crops. And, uh, and again, much of plant breeding literally really involves in, in removing unwanted traits. Most of the time we take the wild crops uh, and then we domesticated them into the, the current crops we grow involved removal of many unwanted traits from the wild crops. And again, removal of traits is a much easier task that could be accomplished by CRISPR genome editing compared to the, 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 hybrid, the traditional methods of hybridization or mutagenesis. For instance, when you look at the seed color here change and the seed site change in soybean and then the change of the oil composition uh, by removing some of the unwanted traits, it could be done. Uh, we, we could see this happening through natural mutations over literally hundreds and hundreds of years, but or it could be done in the lab using chemical or radiation mutagenesis. It could also be done through genetic engineering 
such as transgenesis, but it could be done, uh, the same thing could be done through genome editing. And uh, genome editing is much faster, far more precise, and also there are not many, at least around the world, uh, the regulations are not as uh, detailed and uh, expensive and burdensome as I mentioned. And the traditional way of uh, removing uh, traits uh, through nat natural mutation, random mutation uh, uh, has been uh, very popular in the past 40 or 50 years. You know, we have more than 3,300 more than 3,300 varieties that have been released through the using either radiation or chemical mutagenesis. And so we need to look at uh, the, the limits of traditional mutagenesis. It's very completely random because when you blast a seed with radiation, you don't, you have no idea what kind of changes occur in that. And they're literally, when you're looking for one mutation, you would end up use, inducing thousands of mutations. And so it's very random, it's very extensive. A lot of unknown genomic changes occur. Compared to that, genome editing removes many of these limitations. It's very specific. The, the kind of change that you're making is very clearly known. And so this was one of the another RNA uh, method has been uh, using, uh, sci RNA has been more recently been used in genetic engineering to remove unwanted traits in this case, for instance, with uh, potato and apple, and both of them are released and grown in the United States where the browning trait has been removed so that we have a, a larger shelf life of these fruits when they're cut. And also just about a month ago, USDA approved the release, FDA and USDA approved the release of this pink glow pineapple. It has a higher lycopene content, but simply it has a better attractiveness. And again, many of these can be now made by gene editing. So I just wanted to again show an example where a lot of traits that were even in the recent past were developed through genetic engineering can be produced through gene editing. And these are some of the products that have already uh, been in the, in the research pipeline. A company called Calixt is uh, releasing the acrylamide-free potato that is much healthier, canola, oil that is low in saturated fats, again, much healthier, can be kept for a longer time under room temperature, and, and, and wheat with less gluten. So people who have um, celiac disease or gluten sensitivity would be able to, to consume these products and they are much, much healthier. And Cybers is another company that is not using CRISPR, but they're using their own uh, proprietary technology to, double, to gene edit many of these crops and they're already being grown. And in the research labs, we have many other products in the United States and other countries. Uh, again, canola with a better oil quality, low phytate canola so that uh, many of the nutrients can more, more easily be available. Uh, fungus resistant plants, uh, easier malting barley for beer production, uh, strawberry that's as flowers, which with a longer season, tomato that is constructed from mechan mechanized harvest, uh, disease resistant tomatoes, drought tolerant maize. And so as you can see for a variety of traits, now we are using gene editing. And I just wanted to show some more examples of that. Here is a tomato that where they increase the fruit size. So it is not just qualitative traits, but quantitative traits affecting the yield and productivity are also now being attempted using gene editing. And gene editing is attempted with not just one gene, but even multiple genes. And so we have, uh, again, acrylamide free potato, the low glycoalkaloid potato that's less toxic, and petunia with novel colors, soybean that is nematode resistant, soybean that's drought tolerant, and uh, soybean that's also has a higher oil content. You know, soybean already has 50% oil, is 50% uh, protein, and uh, 
high oil content. And uh, we are now developing even higher oil content, higher soybean protein content and more nutritive wheat. And these are all have already been developed and they have received a, 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 a regulatory or a non-regulatory status uh, from USDA. And I'm going to just show you a few other examples of uh, uh, interest to this particular session. So this is a tomato where, where high lycopene content has been added. You see, as you know, tomato, the fruit color is because of a, 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 a vitamin precursor called lycopene. And, and increased lycopene content is desirable in tomato because of its attractiveness, but also it's much healthier because it's been known that higher lycopene consumption reduces prostate cancer incidence in men. And so this is just to show an example where we can manipulate many of the nutritive values of our food and improve the nutritive content by increasing desirable nutrients such as vitamins and minerals, but also to reduce undesirables such as the glycoalkaloids, the cyanide, and even the allergens that I just briefly mentioned. And CRISPR genome editing is also it's going to help improve the shelf life of our plants. Again, here is an example where a tomato has been developed that can stay at room temperature for a much longer time compared to the regular tomato because a gene for the enzyme that degrades the cell wall has been disabled just by gene editing. And there's a much better example of that with the fruit ripening genes. As you can see in the wild type uh, tomato uh, in, uh, within 61 days uh, after the fruit is formed, it is going to be fully be ripened, but on the other hand, we can slow it down. So what it means is, and we all familiar in, in India where when there's a glut of tomato production, farmers get such poor prices for that. I've seen uh, right on Bangalore Hosur Highway once, for instance, they had thrown all the tomatoes on the, on the main uh, highway because they're so frustrated that they are not able to get a good price. But on the other hand, if we can improve the shelf life and have it stay for a longer time, then they could take it to the markets farther away from the production and also store it for a longer time so when they can sell it when they get the better price. And this is very important. In India, more than 50% of the fruits and vegetables that we grow uh, is, is thrown away. And uh, we can bring this uh, long shelf life technology to most of our fruits and vegetables and just reduce the wastage. So while I mentioned CRISPR, I don't have time to go about many other similar techniques that are there and are being used. And many of them are used in fruits and vegetables to again, to improve the quality, but also to improve many of the nutrients that are desirable and reduce some of the undesirable nutrients. And just a few other example where a disease resistance uh, has been in, in, in there are literally hundreds of examples of this. And this is in the case of rice, where they were able to make the rice very highly resistant to bacterial blight. This is a very important disease of rice in India. We have a lot of work going on at UAS, for instance, right in Bangalore. And uh, development of rice varieties for resistant to diseases is going to be of tremendous value to Indian farming. And this is resistance. And this is one other example where in rice only, by using CRISPR, they were able to make it more diabetes friendly rice. This is simply by altering the ratio of amylose, amylose with amylopectin, they were able to make rice that is not as easily prone to die, easily digestible, and it's much healthier for those who have diabetes. And this is again, a technology that could be done in many, many of our uh, grains. We could also reduce the, the grain size and uh, or increase the grain size. And this is just another example to show such quantitative traits can also be affected by using uh, genes and you can see as you increase the number of genes, we can, we can alter the, the, the seed size. This here in, in wheat, but it could probably be done 
in practically every every crop and plant architecture can also be modified and as you know as you know the much of the green revolution happened because of uh, change in the architecture of plants making dwarf wheat and dwarf rice and so that such types of changes can be made in almost every crop just a couple of example promoting rice growth and productivity and, and just to show that while we are worried about number of genes being altered, we have natural mutations going on in all our crops every day. And when you compare to that, you just change one gene by CRISPR, but naturally, even with, if you don't do anything, there are about 238 genes alter in one season in wheat alone. And so there is, uh, compared to breeding, uh, use of gene editing offers tremendous value and it's much less expensive, much faster. And most importantly, hopefully the Indian regulation would adapt to the reality that this is no different. Uh, gene editing is no different from conventional mutagenesis and just would, uh, would not impose the huge uh, regulation that is required for GM crops. And so this is my final slide, just summarizes everything that we can go do with gene editing for farming enhancing the nutrient levels, make our crops more climate resilient, make it more disease resistant, improve food safety, and extend the shelf life of fruits, vegetables, and flowers, improve the oil quality, and reduce or eliminate toxins in our food. And, uh, and again, the lab to market time is faster with gene editing technology. And while it is good, uh, it is very powerful in removing the traits. You should also remember, we can add traits also through the CRISPR-Cas and other, other technologies. And unlike GM and other techniques, the off-target effects is not a big issue because you're only changing a few nucleotides within the gene. So this is my email if you want to write to me for any more information. I hope you can follow me on Twitter with this, this is my Twitter handle. Can thank you much, very much for your attention and uh, best wishes, bye-bye.